One of the questions that I came up with and was thinking through is, what do you do when the world is falling apart? We're Christians. We, we are faced with some significant issues right now, whether politics, whether it's economical, whether it's war, concepts of religion, faith. The church is, is struggling with its identity right now, trying to come to grips with what does it truly mean to believe? I mean, you're hearing all different signs, and what do you do when, when the world is falling apart? When you look at the stats of how many people are Christians anymore, it's, it's just falling off a cliff. 20% of the people in America believe that the Bible is the Word of God. 11% read it. That stat is read at least once a year. So John is dealing with some significant issue, and you have to ask this, why does John write his gospel? It's very interesting when you look at the synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it, Luke, it seems like they are they're writing the same story and using the same material. You, if you try to read them back to back, you're going to go, wait, I just read this, I just read this, I, I just read this again. And it's great, we need the three different stories, but when you get to John, something significant changes. There's a lot of differences between this, and when you look at the 12 disciples, only four of the disciples actually wrote down something that had made it into the Bible. You can ask about a fifth one, it's debatable. But between you know, Matthew, we write the, the gospel. Luke writes a very short letter to the, the children of Israel who are in the diaspora, who have been spread across uh, the Roman world. James and his letters. And then you get to John. So it's interesting that not all of the disciples are even writing this down, but John, for some reason, realizes that something needs to be done and writes this unique book you will see that it's hard to, to nail it down to say, is this to a, a Jewish audience or is this to a Gentile audience? You'll see verse after verse that he's quoting out of the, the Hebrew text, but then he'll get to the, the wedding in Canaan and talk about these stone vessels that are outside for purification. You're like, the Jewish people know that. You don't have to say that that's a stone vessel for purification. Every Jew knows that that is. So you, you go back and forth and say, is this to a Jewish audience or is this, is this to a Gentile audience? He's adding in comments here and there for each different people group. There's a ton of similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. It's the same story. It talks about a rabbi sent from God to deal with the, to, to the children of Israel and now is teaching throughout Galilee and Judea, is performing miracles, calls disciples, has conflict with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, ends up being crucified by Rome and then raised from the dead. Seen by his disciples. It's the same story, but, but there's also vast differences. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's only one Passover mentioned. You don't know how long his ministry is. John, there's three. John puts the crisis of the temple in the temple right at the beginning of his ministry. The other gospels have it at the end. The Passover meal is different. The dating seems different. He doesn't use parables. He uses discourses. He doesn't cast out demons in John. The baptism's not mentioned. But John is, it, it seems like he's writing a new story. It's, it's a new Genesis. The very first words in the beginning. He's writing about this creator starting something new. He's remaking something. Every sentence, every word, every breath is now putting into concept this new creation. And John keeps building all the way until what, what Pilate declares, here is the man, building to this of God now in flesh. It's not just where he's writing a new Genesis account, he's also writing a new Exodus. You have bread in the desert. You have supplies. You have God tabernacling among us living with us, building into this temple. And now John is saying that this word is now flesh and dwells in us. It's a new creation, a new Exodus story. But when is John writing this gospel message? And it's not an easy thing to, to nail down. There is wide discrepancy in it. Modern scholarship puts it in the, in the mid-150s. 
I would completely disagree with that. But most commentators and scholars will put it late 90s. Is that what's happening in this book? When you look at the dating, there's, there's something that you don't read in the letter. There is no destruction of Jerusalem. Of all the things that a disciple has went through with living with Christ and seeing him die and seeing him resurrected, the, the destruction of Jerusalem kind of is on par with that. If there's a destruction of Jerusalem, you'd think that something would be mentioned in, in this gospel. The geography of the book is early. You don't see the restructuring of the Roman provinces. When, when Rome conquers Jerusalem, the geography changes. Civilizations are changed. City names change. Even the rivers and the lakes names change. And it's not that way. It's an early letter. The language is early. He calls them all disciples. He doesn't call them apostles, the sent ones, which you'll see in the later letters. No, these are the disciples. So for some reason, this letter looks like it's newer. Even more interesting, when you start looking at the early manuscripts, we have fragments of early, early copies. The two that if you want to make a note of sometime, it's P55, which is a really short um, portion of John. And then you have Papyrus Edgerton II, um, which looks to be a part of a codex. A codex just means a compilation of writings. Both of these may have been part of a group of letters put together already. And the dating of these are between 70 and 100 AD. Both of these were found in two separate parts of the world. Different hand, different gatherings of writings. So how can you have writings that are in different hands, different parts of the world, different copies already distributed and have enough quantity of them that you're going to have them in our day in only a few years? It also seems that John's writings is kind of independent of the Synoptic Gospels. You don't even know if he has access to them. If you ever read them side by side, there's not the similarities that you see between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For some reason, this seems to be independent as well. I'll also mention this really briefly in in John chapter 5. It says, Jesus went to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals, and now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pole in the pool of Bethesda. In 70 AD, the pool of Bethesda is destroyed. Now, I am hanging way too much weight on one word in this gospel, but he is saying there is right now in this, the pool of Bethesda. So I would suggest, as a minority view, that he is writing pre-70 AD. But why? What is causing him to do this? It seems like John is written in three different stages. When you begin to read this book, you see this beautiful introduction, this prologue of John chapter 1, this word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, and it's gorgeous. It's well put together. Everything is lined up. Here's what it is. But then you get these writings. It starts in Cana, and it's almost like a journal. You're reading John, and you're right with this passionate disciple, and it's, it's now this happened after this, and now this happened to this. It's like his journal, and you're reading this very intimate reading of it. And then you get to the last part in chapter 21. It seems like it was added on. When you get to the end of chapter 20, it says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. End of chapter 20. Does that sound like an ending? Now you're going to think that because I just told you that. But it sounds like this. You start chapter 1, well, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And they were together, Simon Peter. Something happens here at the end of chapter 20 and chapter 21. In chapter 21, I think we begin to see the reason why John is writing this letter. There is a catalyst that happens that causes John to do something. When you get to chapter 21, 
you'll see this story of the disciples after the resurrection or before Christ shows him, they're out on the Sea of Galilee fishing again. And there's Peter, Nathaniel, James, and John, and two other disciples are out in the Sea of Galilee, and they're fishing. They're not catching anything. Christ is walking on the shore and calls out, do you have any meat? Takes them a while to figure out what's going on. And then Christ calls them and says, put your net on the other side. And they throw the net on the other side, and they, they... catch 153 fish. Peter realizes it's, it's the Messiah and now rushes into the, to the shores. Christ serves breakfast and then turns his attention to John, or tr- turns his attention to Peter. And in this dialogue, we see him ask Peter, Peter, do you love me? There's been a lot of sermons on the, the, the Greek language there between agape and phileo. I'll put that aside. I think there's something bigger that's happening. He asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, of course I love you. And Christ looks at him again and says, but Peter, do do you really love me? Peter's like, yes, I love you. And then Christ asked the third time, Peter, do you really, really love me? Peter's like, of course I love you. And it says that he became ashamed or distraught at the third asking. Why did Christ ask Peter three times? What's the story? The story tells us Peter was, was at the, the, the trial of Christ, and they, they're like, wait a minute, you're, you're one of his disciples, right? You, me? No, I can't be right. But, but you even speak Galilean. No. This is the third time he even curses. I swear to God, I am not. And and Christ looks at Peter and says, okay, Peter, it's more than words. You say it, but are you going to follow me? There's a very precise phrase right after this because they were asking about when certain people were going to die and if they were going to die before Christ returns. And it says that Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? That phrase, the disciples, or at least the followers of Jesus at that time, took it to say the disciples would not die before Christ returned. Their end times theology was wrong. So they tied this on to say, okay, the disciples are going to all, at least they're not all going to die before Christ returns. So in this dispersion of Jews and in this dispersion of Christians, it goes from Antioch of Syria now into Ephesus being the home church. Paul has just went all over the Roman Empire at this point. The disciples have scattered all over the known world from India into Africa, all the way up into England. This movement has taken off in 15, 20 years. It has exploded. Peter seems to be traveling behind Paul, picking up the pieces. I can just see Peter doing this. We got a new church. Where's it at? Okay, going over there. I got to make sure they know. I got to make sure that they're following what Christ's teachings were. Paul's just out there preaching away, preaching away, and Paul, Peter's just running around behind him. And you, you see this. He'll be, Paul's over here, Peter ends up over here. And the church writings have Peter constantly building up the church as it's happening. He's making sure that these new believers are fully grounded in the faith after Paul's evangelism happens. So at the heart of the ministry is Paul the evangelist and Peter coming behind them and uplifting them and giving them the fuller gospel. But something happens. I want you to step back into the world of the 60s and 70s AD. It's a new church. Only 30 years after Christ leaves, It's an explosive movement led by dynamic leaders, people who walked with Christ, first-generation leaders. They have lived with Christ, saw him resurrected. 
but the church is tired. The world is falling apart. The disciples are dying. In just a few years, James put to death by a sword by Herod Agrippa. Philip, tortured and crucified. Matthew was beheaded. James, the head of the church in Jerusalem. James pushed off the temple and then killed. And then July 18, 64 AD, something happens in Rome. It catches fire. 70% of Rome burns. You read through the story, stories and it's just terrible. The fire came from all directions and burned thousands. Nero trying to, to take the blame off himself turns the blame to the Christians. And I'm going to read out a Tacitus here. And so to get rid of this humor, rumor, Nero set up and falsely accused as the culprits and punished with the utmost refinement of cruelty, a class hated for their abominations, who were commonly called Christians. Christ, from whom their name is derived, was executed at the hands of the procurator Pontius Pilate. The movement checked for a moment, but the superstition again broke out, not only in Judea now, but even in the heart of Rome. First arrest was made of those who confessed. Then on their evidence, an immense multitude was convicted. Besides being put to death, they were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clothed in the hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. Others were crucified. Others set on fire to illuminate the night when daylight failed. Of those who were burned, some were tied or nailed to stakes, held still by a hook driven through the throat so they could not move the head when the pitch waxed and other flammable substance were poured boiling over their heads and set on fire. Nero had thrown open the grounds for his display and was putting on a show in the circus where he mingled with the people and drove about in his chariot. Because of this, Paul's head is beheaded. And immediately falling, Peter is crucified upside down in Rome. Andrew is crucified on an olive tree. Thomas has now been thrust through with a spear and tormented with hot plates and burned alive. Bartholomew is crucified. Matthias was stoned and crucified. John's the last guy standing. The disciples are gone. The leader in Jerusalem's gone. The church leader in Rome is gone under Paul. They're gone. Peter's dead. Paul's dead. What do you do? How do you convince people that it's still worth it? Is it worth torment? Is it worth even to the point of being lit on fire and burned to death? Children, family, co-workers, members of churches. You want to talk about fear. You know the people that are being questioned right now. And if they give your name, you're next. The faith of the church is rattled. And they had believed that the disciples would not die before Christ returned. Now what? They are trying, scrambling to understand this gospel. The patristic fathers, the early church fathers, write that John was in Jerusalem at this time. It says that he hurries to Ephesus the heart of the church, the home church of this movement. He's trying to create some organization again back in the movement, saying, okay, let's, let's huddle back together. It's not over. Here's how we move forward. So Paul preached it. Peter witnessed to his testimony. John is now sitting down. I need to rewrite. I need to write this gospel message in its entirety. It's a new exodus. It's a new genesis. There's something new that's here that these people need to hear it. And John is calling these people back to the gospel. Hebrews 11 puts together a really great understanding of this. It says, remember those earlier days that you had received the light when you endured in great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison, joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property, 
because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly awarded. Don't fall away. Don't throw away your confidence. It is worth it. So when you read through John, you're going to feel an urgency. These powerful stories are written in a way with such tremendous weight behind them. Imagine him sitting there trying to write through this and think through, how can I portray that this is worth it for these people? He's grabbing them, trying to get their attention, show them the urgency in this message. There is a story There is an eyewitness account. Here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you get to the end of chapter 20, say these things are written so that you believe. What do you do when the world is falling apart? A great starting point is the book of John. Why has this book helped so many people? Why when you get a new convert or get something in the church, just read John. Why? Because it's detailing out this story when the world is falling apart around us. So when you get into chapter 1, he rewrites the story of Genesis saying, in the beginning was the Word. Very beginning, the Word of God is there. This Word is alive. It was, it is, and it will always be. It doesn't matter what happens around us. This Word is alive, and everything is made by Him. And in Him is life. And this life is the light of men. He's the true light. And lights every man that is in this world. It talks about this word comes down to his own, and his own doesn't even receive them. We often read that, that the Jews didn't receive him. No, this creator God comes down to his creation, and creation says, I don't know him. But there's a witness. John the Baptist bore witness and said, Is this the Lamb of God? This is him. You see Andrew, Peter, Philip all follow him. Nathaniel stands up and says, Thou art the Son of God. Right now, you are the Son of God. And then he ends up the, the chapter 1 by saying that you're going to see the heavens open up and you're going to see angels ascending and descending, pulling us back to that Genesis story of Jacob wrestling with the angel and seeing the angels, angels coming up and down into heaven. And just as Jacob was blessed and becomes Israel, His disciples will become blessed, and God will give them the power to go out into all the world. And then launching out of chapter 1, he writes two separate concepts. He's trying to deal with Judaism that believes that what you do is the truth, and a Gentile opinion or view of what you say is the truth. So he combines this into two storylines. You're going to see seven... um, Signs and wonders or miracles, and you're going to see seven I am sayings. And he's weaving these together to say, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, you all are going to witness to this story. The seven signs match the seven days of creation. The seven sayings are this interaction with man and God in building towards the temple. So you see it, and I'm just, like I said, I'm giving you a brief overview. I'm just skipping across the top. And I know pastor's going to be digging into some of these even more. But he says, I am the bread of life. What is this bread? I'm all that you need. I am the light of the world. In this story, you see that a woman is hauled before the prosecutors in in the temple. And instead of a man accusing her, normally the, the man that was found would testify or even the husband would testify, but they're not there. And Christ bends over and writes in the dust. And he says, I am the light. The true light, when it is on, when it comes into the world, darkness has to flee. Yes, the world is falling apart, but in Christ, the light will overcome darkness. If you want to make a statement, if you want to be the light in your world, if you want to change your world, Christ is the light. Darkness will flee. Then John chapter 10, he says, I am the door. He heals a man during the Feast of the Tabernacles. And the Jewish leaders are in an uproar. How can you heal on the Sabbath? It's against the law. He's like, no, 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 I'm the door. You may want to block him from getting in. That's not how it works. I'm the door. Everything goes through me. 
the Roman Empire itself may blame you, may try to convict and convince people not to enter in. doesn't matter. I am the door. In John chapter 10, verse 11, the Jewish leaders have led some of the sheep astray. And he says, no, no, I, I'm the good shepherd. Calling back to Ezekiel chapter 34, where he says, I myself will look after my sheep. I will go and find them. Yes, the Jewish leaders are trying to scare off the sheep. Yes, they've been spread across the Roman Empire. It doesn't matter. I am seeking and saving that which is lost. In 11, he says, I am the resurrection and life. There's this discussion with Lazarus. Lazarus is laying sick, now dead. What's going to happen? If you'd have came earlier, you could have done something, but it's been too long. He's like, wait a minute here. I'm the resurrection and life. Death doesn't do anything. I've conquered this. Sitting there as an early believer, hearing John read these, these stories, or reading his writings for the first time, what would you say to that? When you hear these words, how will it impact you? I can't, I can't grasp what some of these early Christians did. Some of them would stand there and see somebody on the burning pile, and they would look around and say, anybody, or anybody else is Christians, and they would climb up on the pile beside them. But when you grasp this concept that he is the resurrection of life, death, it's about a moment. We get the sixth one in John chapter 14 where he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. As soon as he said that, every Jewish believer or Jewish listener would realize that he's talking about the temple. We don't think this way, but in the temple and tabernacle, the doorways and the separation between the areas was the doorways. And it was called the way outside of the common where the, the offering would happen with the bronze altar. That's the doorway of the way. You go into the holy place, it's the truth, because that is where the truth is. And go into the holy of holies, it was called the doorway of life. Here again, he's saying, guys, don't you realize that access to God is through me? It doesn't matter what's happened. You can enter in to offer your sacrifices and can be forgiven. It's through me. You can go into the holy place where the light of the world is and the bread of, of, of covenant is, is there. It's there, but it's through me. You want to go enter into the very space where God dwells. It's through me. I am the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. In John chapter 15, he says, I'm the true vine. You must remain in me. I need you to be fruitful. If you're not fruitful, I'm going to prune you, not to destroy you. You don't prune a tree to destroy it. You prune it so it's more fruitful. I, you got to stay in me because this is what I need you to do. Woven in between these I am statements are these seven miracles, the first one being the, the miracle of Canaan. He gets there. We, we heard the message on this about him turning water into wine. In that last day, the hills will flow with an abundance of wine. It was a 70-some gallons of, of wine. That's a lot of wine. What is he saying? I can take water and transform it into something else. You want to talk about creation. It's not taking grape juice and turning it into wine. It's taking nothing, just water, and creating something else. It doesn't matter what you bring. You may feel like you're just water. You may not have value, and God says, wait a minute here, I can transform the ordinary into something extraordinary. You see then in John chapter 4, he heals the official son. It's a long-distance healing. It's an amazing story. If you understand geography, it's all uphill to where Christ is in Canaan, and Christ is dwelling in Canaan, because I guess they really liked him there, because probably the wine. But the official in Capernaum hears that Christ is there and rushes out to meet him. It's says, good nine, nine and a half hour walk straight uphill. It's a brutal walk. He gets there about one o'clock in the afternoon and says, hey, my son is dying. If we leave right now, we can make it to Capernaum before it's dark. It's about a five, five and a half hour walk all downhill. To... And Christ says, okay, but your son be healed. Now, the, the story isn't that Christ healed him. It's that as well. The story is what did the official do after Christ healed his son? Did he rush home? No. It says the next day, he meets the, his servants running up the hill going, hey, by the way, your son is healed. He's like, oh, what time? Oh, about one o'clock. That was when Christ said he would. When you meet Christ, the urgency disappears. 
Because you trust him. You believe that he did what he said he would do. Then you see the healing of the man beside the pool of Bethesda. And the, pool, the man says, I have nobody to help me into the waters. You want to talk about desperate. No one in my life will help me. And Christ says, I don't care. I can use that. Jesus is the one who will help you when nobody else will. And then you see this feeding of the 5,000. 5,000 people are starving because Christ has preached for days. And he's just has nothing except a few, a few fish and loaves of bread. And, and, and the disciples said, but we have nothing. It's like, that's fine. What you bring isn't, isn't needed. It's what Christ does is what is important. Jesus doesn't lack resources. Nero may take everything that you have. It doesn't matter. And you see him walking on water. And understand that there's no power that Christ can't conquer. There's nothing that the evil one can throw in his way. He just calms the storm. His power is unlimited. And then the pool of Siloam, he heals a blind man. Nobody knew who the blind man was. I find it interesting. They heal him and they take him before the, the, the temple to verify it. he was healed. And they're like, who is this guy? He was literally right outside the temple. Nobody paid attention to him. He had to go get his family members to go, is this the guy? And like, yeah, that's the guy. It doesn't matter if nobody pays attention to you. Christ can change it. And looks at this blind man, heals the blind man, and gives him eyes to see. And now has a new life. And the last one you see with this axe is the resurrecting of Lazarus. So far now, God can even raise the dead just by speaking. So when you see this climax of this book, when you see it coming all together, you read these stories, you understand when he writes, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes on him is not condemned, but whoever does not... Believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that, that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. When you read these stories of John, you realize the weight of it and saying, people, God can do everything. Yes, the disciples will die, but Christ lives in us. We could spend hours, days, a lifetime trying to understand the theology of John. But ultimately, it's as simple as John 3.16 pulling us back. It doesn't matter what's happening in the world. Pulling us back to this very simple truth. Do you believe this eyewitness story or not? John's saying, I was there. I saw it. I lived with him. I saw him dead. I saw him raised. Yes, everybody has died around this. But now this testimony is here. Will you believe the truth? Are you going to make sure that you are following into the way, the truth, and the life? Will you trust this story about Jesus? Jesus has overcome everything. He weaves through this. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew. It doesn't matter if you're a Samaritan. It doesn't matter if you're an outcast. It doesn't mind if you're blind or lame. It doesn't matter if you're a Gentile. All are now welcomed with Christ. And then he says, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And when I come back, I'm going to receive you to myself. We are now the betrothed bride of Christ. We're under covenant with him. Our faith is in him to do what he needs to do. The story we don't know. I hope we don't have to go through persecution like they did. But we may. But when we read this, we realize that he is the good shepherd. 
He is the true vine. He is the word. He is the life. He's the door. And everything is in him. And he looks at his disciples and says, As the Father has sent me now, I send you. And then you realize the story hits home. We're called to go no matter the consequence. Doesn't tell us that our glory is in our death. Our glory is bringing life and light to men. So Christ looks at Peter and says, don't look around. Don't worry about who's going to die or not. Will you follow me? I asked that question, will you follow him? Will you accept this eyewitness report and accept this gift of life, this new beginning, this new spirit, this new mission that is happening? Do you believe the testimony that these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ? I ask of you, if you have time, read John. Spend time in it. Sit down and say, okay, step back into 60, 70 AD. How these stories would have impacted you. And then just open up the news, get scared again, and go, wait a minute, I need to read John and reread it again.